This is a Mercedes AMG GLE 63S Coupe, and it's a serious AMG performance car. Up here is a twin turbo V8 with 577 horsepower. It'll lose zero to 60 in 4.1 seconds. Those are serious numbers, and yet, you hate this car. In fact, from talking to people, I've found that pretty much everyone hates this car. Today, I'm gonna explain why. I've borrowed this AMG GLE 63S Coupe here in Los Angeles using Turo, which is this service that lets you rent cool and interesting cars instead of normal, boring airport rental cars. You can sign up for Turo if you click the link in the description below, and if you do that, you'll get $25 off your first rental. Unfortunately, I suspect you won't want to rent this because, well, Everyone hates this car. But before I get into why, here's a brief overview. The GLE Coupe is one of seven different SUVs Mercedes-Benz now makes, from the little GLA all the way up to the boxy G-Wagon. To create the GLE Coupe, Mercedes took the regular GLE and they sort of sat on it to create this sloping roof line in the back. Here in North America, the GLE Coupe is sold in two versions. There's the base level GLE 43 AMG, and there's this, the AMG GLE 63S Coupe, which starts at around $114,000. So anyway, today I'm going to show you around the GLE 63S Coupe, and we're going to discuss why everyone hates it, and then I'm going to show you all of its interesting quirks and features, and then I'm going to get behind the wheel and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. I'm going to start my explanation of why I think people hate the GLE 63 Coupe with the styling, which I think is the biggest sticking point, and particularly the styling around back here, namely the fact that it looks like a regular SUV except it's squatting. This weird sloped roof line kind of comes down and it's a very unusual design. About 10 years ago, the BMW X6 started this squatting SUV trend, and every SUV that has come out since then to emulate it has gotten a lot of hate. But it isn't just the look of this thing that makes people irrationally angry. Part of it is the fact that when you get an SUV, you're getting it because you want more practicality, better ground clearance for off-roading, more cargo space and passenger space to carry things and people, and then you get the squatting one and it removes most of that practicality. And I think one thing that people really hate about it is this car sort of broadcasts to the world, yeah, I have an SUV, but I I don't need one. I'm only getting this because I'm sitting up high and I don't actually need the practicality benefits that come with actually owning an SUV. This whole look is basically aggressively telling the world that you've chosen to drive a big wasteful SUV and you don't need to. And it isn't just that. Mercedes-Benz does this vehicle no favors in the car world by calling it a coupe, which is something else that makes people very, very angry. Now, when I grew up, a coupe was a two-door car. Over the last few years, a few automakers have stretched that to include sort of coupe-looking four-door cars, like the BMW 6 Series Grand Coupe and the Mercedes CLS four-door coupe. But now Mercedes has expanded that definition to include a four-door SUV. So not only is this no longer a two-door sports car, it's a four-door SUV that is still called a coupe, and that really makes people angry. And then rounding out the trifecta of reasons why people hate the GLE Coupe, there's the fact that this is a performance luxury SUV, which is probably the most hated category, especially by car enthusiasts. Most car enthusiasts hate luxury SUVs to begin with. Oh, those rich people and their big SUVs they don't need. But then you add in a performance luxury SUV, and it really takes things to a whole new level. It's like, oh, those damn rich people in their big SUV, they don't need, they could have just had a performance car, they're never going to use all the benefits of this thing, they don't need an SUV. People get so mad. Although, I have to admit, when it comes to this vehicle and not using the full capabilities and people buying them just to show off, you have to kind of admit that the car enthusiasts have a point. But anyway, moving on to the quirks and features, and I'll start with one especially unique quirk, and that would be the rear headroom. Now, owing 
to the sloped roof line of this vehicle, the rear headroom isn't great. I'm six foot four and sitting back here is fine, but I notice when I put my head back, it doesn't rest on the headrest, but rather on the roof of the vehicle, which isn't really the ideal situation. If I sit all the way back, my head is touching the top of the car and the back of my head is actually resting on the roof, which is unusual. I wouldn't necessarily want to be chilling in this thing if it rolled over. Next up, we move on to cargo capacity. You pop open the tailgate and you'll find that the cargo area is reasonably deep and fairly wide, but it isn't especially tall owing to the sloped roof line. In fact, the GLE Coupe has 40% less cargo room than the regular GLE. Maybe more importantly, the GLE 63 Coupe is $10,000 more expensive than the regular GLE 63. So you're paying 10% more for 40% less cargo room. It doesn't seem like an especially great deal unless you just want to show off that you have the coupe. Also worth noting, with the coupe version, the load floor is unbelievably high off the ground. It's like three and a half feet up here. So if you're trying to carry some sort of heavy item and get it in the back, good luck. Anyway, moving on to the rest of the quirks, I'm going to start around back. Now, I've covered a lot of modern Mercedes-Benz models and other reviews, so I'm only going to focus on the quirks that are unique to this car. I'm going to start with the backup camera. Now, if you look back here, you will notice there is no camera back here, but we know this car has a backup camera, so where are they hiding it? Well, it turns out the hiding place is a pretty clever one. If you put this car in reverse, you will see the backup camera pop out of the Mercedes-Benz logo in the tailgate and that is a pretty cool little trick. And the camera doesn't just come out when you put it in reverse. In fact, there's an option in the infotainment system to open the camera cover and then it slides out from underneath the Mercedes-Benz logo. That way, if there's grime or debris on the camera, you can open it yourself so that you can clean it without having to put your car in reverse in order to access it. With all that said, one thing you'll find missing back here that Mercedes-Benz isn't hiding is a rear wiper. This car just doesn't have it. Apparently, the rear window is sloped enough that Mercedes Benz feels it doesn't deserve a rear wiper. Next, we must move on to the running boards, which I really don't like. First off, this car isn't tall enough to need running boards. No one really needs the assistance to climb inside this car, but even if you did, they're not really wide enough for you to stick a foot on, so they're not really all that helpful. More importantly, they don't exactly help the look of this car. They're silver with these sort of black dots on them. They're not especially attractive. I guess the black dots are supposed to be there to gain traction with your shoes, but they really don't help the look of these things. Ultimately, they're not very useful and not nice looking. Next up, moving into the GLE Coupe and onto the back seats. Aside from the headroom, there's not much interesting to report back here, but there is one unusual item, and that's the fact this car seats five people. There are three seats in back. I say that that's unusual because most of these four-door coupe vehicles only have four seats, two in the front and two in the back, but this one has three back here, so you don't give up all the practicality by getting the GLE. GLE Coupe. Another interesting item back here are the rear coat hooks. A lot of cars have rear coat hooks. Usually they're fixed in place, but in this car they deploy. You press them and then they are slowly and finely presented to you so you can hang your coat on them. Next up, moving on to the front, there are a couple of interesting quirks and features up here, one of which is the paddle shifters. In my own 2012 Mercedes-Benz and all the other older Mercedes-Benz models, they say plus and minus on them, but in this car they've changed them to say up and down. I wonder if people were getting confused about what plus and minus meant and Mercedes-Benz had to spell it out even more clearly. Next up, one interesting item that's worth mentioning is the hold function in this car, which is something I think a lot of Mercedes-Benz owners don't know about. Check this out. If you get up to a stoplight in this car and you're sick of keeping your foot on the brake, you can push down on the brake really hard and that temporarily activates the hold function and then you don't have to hold the brake anymore. Just push it down hard once, hold comes on, and then the car will hold itself in place until you press the accelerator and drive off. A lot of cars have auto hold features like this, but usually they're activated with a little button. In this car, it's sort of a hidden Easter egg. You have to know to push down the brake pedal in order to turn it on. Next up, we move on to the middle. And something I'm disappointed about in certain Mercedes-Benz models is the plastic in the center control stack. The weird thing about this car is the materials are truly excellent all throughout the interior. The dashboard is leather, it's stitching, there's carbon fiber, 
fiber, everything looks great, but you get right to the middle of the center stack and there's just a bunch of cheap plastic and it looks really crappy. That's the only place they put the cheap plastic, but it's right there in one of the most visible focal points of the entire interior. It makes no sense. In a lot of other Mercedes models, they've stopped doing that, but some models still have this and it looks terrible. Next up, moving on to the steering wheel. It's a nice thick steering wheel like you'd expect from an AMG car. The interesting thing about this steering wheel is that at the top of the steering wheel, in the middle, there's a little strip of white. Now, race cars have that contrasting color on the steering wheels at the top to let drivers know when the wheel is centered. So if they're in hard cornering, they can know exactly when it's back in the middle. I don't know that it's necessary in a road going SUV. In fact, I think it's so unnecessary that most of the people who buy this car probably won't even realize what it's supposed to be mimicking, that it's supposed to be something out of a race car. I think they'll just think it's a random white strip in the steering wheel. Probably an unnecessary expense, Mercedes-Benz. Next up, here's an interesting little quirk. The cruise control stock sticks off the steering wheel in the bottom, and there is a little dial on the end to let you adjust your following distance since it has adaptive cruise control. The interesting thing about that dial is it has a little picture printed on it showing that it adjusts the following distance, but then if you adjust it fully, they've printed the picture on there a second time. And that way, regardless of whether you have the little dial all the way up or all the way down, you can still see that it is the dial to adjust your following distance. A little redundancy to make things just that much more easy to understand how they operate. That's a smart idea. Next up, we move on to visibility. Now, you might think because of this car's sloping roof line that visibility is absolutely destroyed, but actually it isn't as bad as you think. You look back there and visibility is frankly just as good as it is in a lot of SUVs without the sloping roof line. It also helps that this car has fairly large mirrors sort of tailored to see exactly in your blind spot and it has a blind spot monitor to make sure you can see what's going on back there. So the sloping roof line takes away cargo space and rear seat headroom, but it doesn't really harm visibility that much. Next up, I want to talk about park assist. This car has a very strange park assist feature. You know, in some cars it shows you in the infotainment system if you're getting close to an object, and obviously this car displays a camera to show that, but it also has a second secondary park assist feature in the front and in the back that shows with little lines whether or not you're approaching something. Take a look as I back up. You can see it's mounted in the roof there so you can see it in your mirror and as you're getting closer to something it shows more and more lines to let you know how much distance you have left. It's the same thing in the front. There's another one of those displays mounted on the top of the dashboard and as you get really close to something it starts to show more and more lines to let you know that you're approaching something and you should probably be careful. Mercedes-Benz developed the system years ago before they even had cameras. And although the cameras do most of the work now, frankly, I think those little park assist things are actually pretty good and they're pretty useful. Next up, we move on to the infotainment system. Now, in most brand new Mercedes-Benz models, you get a whole array of color choices for the interior ambient lighting. In this particular model, you can change the interior ambient lighting color, but you only get three options. There's polar, solar, and neutral. Polar is bluish, solar is yellowish, and neutral is white. That's all you get, but at least you can change the colors if you wish. Next up, I really like this vehicle data screen, which shows various pieces of vehicle data. My favorite is that as you turn the steering wheel, it tells you exactly how many degrees you've turned it. Now, if you turn it to full lock, you can see it only goes up to 41 degrees, but I have noticed if you pull on it really hard, you can get it to go all the way to 43 degrees for a little extra steering enjoyment. You never know when those extra two degrees of turning circle might come in handy. Another interesting item, you can go into engine data and see real-time horsepower and torque numbers. As you rev the engine, you can see that the horsepower and torque numbers climb. The interesting thing about this is the gauges go up to 700 horsepower and 700 pound-feet, even though this car has only 577 horsepower and 561 pound-feet. Now, I can understand a speedometer goes up to 200 even though the car can't do 200 because they reuse speedometers in different models. But I mean, this is electronic. Can't you tailor it to each specific car rather than show the same gauge from an S65 and the GLE 63? It's just a screen. Shouldn't that be pretty easy to adjust? You would think, but nevertheless, even if you're using full power in this car, there will always be a gap of about 130 horsepower between what you're using and what the screen shows you could be using if you had gotten a better car. 
And finally, another interesting item in the infotainment system is in the navigation system settings. If you go into the root options menu, it will allow you to choose how many people are in your vehicle. You could choose between just you or two people or two or more people. Now you might be thinking, why would you ever want to tell your car how many people are riding in it? How could that possibly matter for the navigation system? Well, the answer is HOV lanes. The car knows that there's an HOV lane that requires two or more people or three or more people. And so if you tell it how many people are riding in it, it can actually tailor the navigation route to the number of occupants in your vehicle, which is just crazy. The problem is it's kind of cumbersome to actually have to go in there every time you start a navigation destination and tell the car how many people are riding in it. Nonetheless, it's an option you can actually take advantage of. And so that's a tour of the AMG GLE 63S Coupe. Now it's time to get behind the wheel and see if the driving experience is worth hating too. All right, driving the GLE 63 Coupe. Now obviously the ride quality is a little harsh. It has these very thin tires on it and it's an, you know, an AMG performance car. Even in comfort, honestly, it, it feels a little harsh. Acceleration, I'm gonna floor it. It's quick, it's quite quick. Um, there's, that's just how it is. <laughs> the throttle response is excellent uh, when you're in sport mode. Oof, but when you're in sport mode, man, that ride. It gets going quick. It feels very fast. Um, it moves even from mid-range, even considering the vast size of this vehicle. I mean, it's not a full-size SUV, but it's a big, wide, lumbering SUV, and yet it's still it still moves if you're in sport mode and you press the accelerator, it hauls. Visibility really isn't so bad back there. You would think it is, but it's really not that bad. Over the shoulder is not great, but the mirrors are good. And honestly, most luxury SUVs these days are going with sort of these weird three quarters looks. I mean, if you've been in a Lexus RX lately, you know that luxury SUV visibility is not what it used to be. Just driving along in traffic, it seems like a pretty rational and reasonable vehicle. Um, I mean, it's it's a lot like any other AMG SUV, GLE AMG. It's, it's a car you can use every day, whatever. It's also a car that's very fast. And you know, it handles a little bit better than a standard GLE or X5 or whatever. Um, I am a little bit disappointed in the handling in this car. I've been driving it for a little while now. Uh, it's fine. The steering is pretty vague. It's not especially sharp. Um, and you can't, you don't really feel like you can push it hard through corners. It's a big, heavy vehicle. Um, I guess I'm a little disappointed. I should have known that it wouldn't be great considering its size an SUV, but I, you know, have an AMG station wagon and I kind of thought it would feel like that, but actually you do feel the added heft and the added size. I think when people buy the AMG GLE 63 specifically, they're mostly buying it for the straight line acceleration and to be cool and have the top of the line GLE coupe. Um, I don't think anybody's really buying it for handling. It's nice and quiet in here, even for an AMG car. It feels uh, nice and quiet and removed from the road. It feels like a luxury car. I mean, you spend $120,000 and you want certain things and, and uh, Mercedes has delivered them quite well. And so that's the Mercedes AMG GLE 63S Coupe. I don't get the hate for this car because frankly it has a wide market appeal. It's perfect for anyone who lives down a dirt road so they need the ground clearance of an SUV but they don't have kids and they don't ever carry anything because the cargo room isn't all that good and yet they need a performance car because they take their SUV on the racetrack and they have a budget of six figures for a new car. This is literally tens of people and we should stop hating on their car of choice. Anyway, now it's time to give it a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the GLE 63 Coupe just doesn't look good. It's a weird design, it's not handsome, it gets a 4 out of 10. Acceleration does 0 to 60 in 4.1 seconds, which gives it a 7 out of 10. Handling is fine, but only fine, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Fun Factor is okay, but this car is mostly about bold styling and a big engine, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Cool Factor is really low. Most car people I know abhor this car, and regular people don't seem to want to let it in in traffic and it gets a 3 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 25 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories. Starting with features, it's fine but a bit behind the latest and greatest and it gets a 6 out of 10. Comfort is only okay. The ride is unusually harsh and it gets a 6 out of 10. Quality is fine. Most of the interior is nice but that center control stack is disappointing and it gets a 6 out of 10. Practicality is only okay. It's a fairly large SUV and it can carry 5 people easily enough but between the smaller cargo area, the weak fuel economy and the challenging rear headlights
headroom, it gets only a 7 out of 10, which lags one point behind most SUV rivals of similar size. Finally, value, and it's hard to call this car a good one. It'll drop in value quickly, and it's very expensive for what it is, and it gets a 5 out of 10 for a total daily score of 30 out of 50. Add it up, and the Doug score is 55 out of 100, which places it near the very bottom of the luxury performance SUV world, even below the Jaguar F-Pace S, which I thought was very mediocre. The GLE Coupe is built for a very specific type of consumer. I am not that consumer, and that's fine with me.